This edition of the Riddler Report is brought to you by PortCityCoin.com I don't know about you, but I'm always running out of interesting talk radio type stuff to listen to. Yeah, stuff that's interesting to me, anyway. If I have that problem, I bet some of you out there have that problem. So I'm starting to try and help fill the gap by producing uh, Ridleyos that are long enough to, to sort of download one after another and just listen to the audio. Basically, any time you see one of mine that's 20 minutes or longer, that's probably what it is. So YouTube has a feature where you uh, can click on, uh, when, you, when you search a bunch of videos out, then you can click filter and it will show you only the ones that are 20 minutes or longer. I know I use that a lot when I run out of Free Talk Live to listen to and I want to search the world for anything interesting that's audio. Well, I look for videos that are 20 minutes or longer. And if they're discussing uh, cryptocurrency, for instance, they usually have high quality audio and uh, no real need to look very closely. So you can listen while you're eating. Anyway, I'm going to probably do this more along the lines of New Hampshire news, but maybe there will be crypto stories or whatnot. But anyway, this is one of them. This is uh, one of the uh, long New Hampshire reads. First, I'm just going to read some free keen articles because that's another problem that I have, which is I assume other people have, is that I don't really want to sit and read an article. I want to uh, hear it while I'm doing something else. So I'm getting two things done at once. So if you're, if you're like me, you're really glad Free Keen is out there, but you don't actually read entire articles very often. Well, now here's your chance to do so while you're doing something else. On November 13th, Ian at FreeKeen.com posts, quote, two newspaper appearances in one day, exclamation mark. I've long stated that libertarians in New Hampshire are making a bigger impact than anywhere else. That's because we've concentrated our efforts here as part of an ongoing NH freedom migration. And turns out, concentrating activists in one geographic area actually works. Besides the haters who target our activists, you can also tell we're effective because the media not only writes about our activism regularly, but also reaches, reaches out for comment on other issues that don't even directly involve us. This happens here because libertarians in New Hampshire are a relevant political force, and we cannot be ignored like happens to other libertarians in other states. Today I have the honor of being included in two different newspaper articles in two different newspapers. First up, union leader reporter Megan Pierce's story about Dublin's counterproductive new paraphernalia ordinance that was their top story of the day. I was given the last word in the piece. Thanks, Megan. Ian goes on to quote the article. Quote, Apparently the chief, Suko, and town council just can't let go of this insane war on drugs and have just, just have to keep pushing to extract more money and obedience from peaceful cannabis users who are our neighbors, co-workers, and friends. Unquote, or unsubquote, or whatever you want to call it. Again, quoting Ian Freeman from the article, uh, from his own article. Uh, he says, quote, Also today, Steve Whitmore from the Keen Sentinel called me early this morning to get a comment on Christopher Cantwell's court hearing last week, where two of the three felony charges were dropped against him. Here's Whitmore's story that appeared in today's Sentinel. In case you need more reasons to join the most successful libertarian movement in the world, here are 101 of them in a really entertaining documentary film. Unquote. The next article on freekeen.com is also by Ian Freeman. It was from November 12th. It says, quote, Imam accused of being drunk by city of Keen bureaucrat. Will Coley, Imam of the soon-to-be-open Malik Center in Keen, NH, recently made the mistake of asking permission to put up a sign for the mosque he's opening in Keen. Realizing that asking permission only gives bureaucrats reasons to create hoops to jump and fees to pay, Will went in to inform them that he intends to move in ahead with or without their permission slip, per the freedom of speech and religion. During the interaction, one particularly rude bureaucrat insults me and then issues an even bigger insult to Will as a Muslim. She actually asserts that he smells of alcohol, a ridiculous claim given it's been over a decade since he's drank any. 
Here's the full video of his interactions with authoritarian bureaucrats on Thursday afternoon. With the story already hitting one of the Sentinel's front pages yesterday, it's already looking like the people calling themselves the City of Keene are going to be an international laughing stock again, with such insulting and threatening behavior not long after suffering defeat after defeat, all the way to the NH Supreme Court in the Robin Hood case, where they tried and failed to crush the free speech of activists who have rescued thousands of motorists from parking tickets. Enjoy the video and subscribe to freekeen.com for the latest on the Malik Center and any further threats or aggression from the city gang. Unquote. Okay, now maybe I can do this better in terms of the delivery. I'll work on that. I'm just getting started. Okay, the third article from November 9th. Also by Ian Freeman. Quote, The Schmitz, prominent anti-chalking haters, foreclosed on, leaves trash house. This blog had, uh, quote, quote, this blog has, for more than a decade, chronicled the ongoing NH freedom migration of libertarian-type folks moving to New Hampshire and getting active for liberty. Over those years, we've seen plenty of opposition by various groups and groups of haters. Anonymous hit piece blogs, all long since offline, so I can't link them. Full-color attack mailers, hate flyers distributed around the town, and in recent years, actual real-life counter-protests and even seminars about libertarians and how evil we supposedly are. It's truly an honor to be attacked. They say, you don't take flack unless you're over the target. No one should be surprised that there will be vehement opposition when libertarians actually start making an impact, as we have done here in New Hampshire. Most libertarians don't understand what it's like to be hated, because outside of New Hampshire, the libertarian movement is little more than a sideshow. They have near zero impact with their political campaigns, and that's about all they do besides argue on the internet. Here in the Shire, libertarian activists regularly get mainstream media coverage in newsprint, on TV, and radio. Here we matter, despite the online trolls who spend their precious time trying to convince us we don't. Of course, the fact that they spend such inordinate time on us is evidence against their own claims. Every now and then a hater will get out from behind their computer monitor and actually make a real-life appearance. Sometimes they are memorable and hilarious, like the time Sam Dodson was assaulted by a former coffee shop owner wielding a coffee cup. Both have long since left in H. Sometimes they are threatening and violent. However, very rarely are their efforts sustained for any mean meaningful amount of time. Every hate group that has risen has also fallen away. However, one couple really stood out above all the other haters, Matthew and Jennifer Schmidt. Over the last half a decade, the Schmidts have made themselves into public activists after joining multiple real-life events designed to target peace-loving libertarian activists in the keen area with hatred. I first recall encountering Matt in an impressively large counter-protest in Central Square by the then-new and energized hate group Stop Free Keen. He later truly made a name for, him, for himself in the war on chalk that happened throughout the summer of 2014. While the war on chalk initially involved a handful of haters, it wasn't long before Matthew Boston Strong Schmidt was the last man standing on their side. His dedication was unmatched. Every day before he'd go to work as a plumber in his original home of Massachusetts, he'd come down to Central Square and remove any chalkings he could find. Then later in the day, after he got off work, he'd be right back down to Central Square with his broom and a bucket of water. What kind of man makes it his business to delete... Not only peaceful chalkings by libertarians, including some very beautiful artwork, but also those chalkings by children, and those done by a local church group trying to raise awareness of homelessness. Had he just kept his hate activism to deleting chalkings, maybe we'd never have gotten to know more about him, but he just couldn't stop. Turns out he lives just a few houses north of my home, which we discovered when he ironically came out to do his own chalking in the street in front of the Keene Activist Center. At this point, we didn't know his name, but he allegedly threatened a local peaceful chalk artist and simultaneously claimed to be from Boston, so Rich Paul named him Boston Strong. Later, we learned his name, Matthew Schmidt. 
homeowner since 2005, a year before I arrived in Keene. His obsession with us grew when he would drive by the corner where I live, and at that time was also the Keene Activist Center, he'd lay on his horn and scream at the top of his lungs. At that time, Chris Cantwell, the angry libertarian comedian Chris, pre-racism days, lived across the street from me in the Capitalist House. In an excellent blog by Garrett Ian, who was also living on the corner in question, he describes how Cantwell and Schmidt competed to prove who was the worst neighbor in a confrontation that happened in front of Schmidt's house between the two. Schmidt had, as was common, driven by our corner yelling something at the corner in general. So Cantwell went down to confront him about his unneighborly behavior. Matt's wife Jennifer was also present, accusing me falsely of being a pedophile, while Schmidt drunkenly calls Cantwell a temporary resident among other entertaining interactions. Normally I wouldn't put any time into researching or paying attention to haters, but those who go the extra mile and engage in threatening behavior should be outed publicly. Curiously, I actually had an online exchange with Schmidt later where he admitted that he was upset I'd blogged about him and his wife. <clears throat> I'd never have been aware of who they were had they not made it their business to target the libertarian community here with their hatred. All I did was show their actions to the world and tried to be fair about it, despite their hatred. When Jennifer Schmidt was accused by another River Street neighbor of threatening the neighbor's ward with a knife, I reported that she was ultimately vindicated of the charges after the neighbor failed to put her boy on the witness stand. Later in the year, Schmidt was confronted on video by Rich Paul and David Crawford over laying on his horns where Schmidt famously threatens to make the lives of the children living on the corner a living nightmare, while claiming, everyone loves what I'm doing. They love it. In 2015, one of Matt Schmidt's last known public appearances, his violent side was again revealed when he threatened, uh, threatened J.P. Freeman that he was going to wrap your head in with a ratchet. Fast forward to this August, when, while out walking my dog on Friday evening, and there's a full-size moving truck pulled up to the Schmidt's house, which the couple, quote-unquote, owned. By noon the next Friday, it was gone. Two months later, according to city records, it was sold for under $48,000 at foreclosure. Now there's a giant dumpster in the front yard filled to the brim with all the junk they left in the house. Perhaps rather than targeting peace liberty actors with hatred, they should have focused on getting their own lives in order. It's not a surprise that people who were so mean and nasty outwardly were a mess in the rest of their lives. Unquote. Again, that's Ian Freeman, uh, writing on freekeen.com. Yeah, it's interesting as I read these things, you know, there's a subtle art to making propaganda that doesn't sound so much like propaganda that it annoys people. Of course, I probably haven't mastered it myself, and I especially the not annoying people part, but... Yeah, there's, there is always something in the wording of these free keen articles. Or there, there is often something in the wording that just sort of drips of, yeah, hyperbole. I guess that's the right word. And cliches. I think if I hear the word peaceful people one more time, I'm going to stop being peaceful. But, as with most things, the really worst article is the one that isn't written. You're better off with 10 imperfect articles than 5 perfect ones. As long as you don't have any significant factual errors. The next article from Freekeen.com. Although I will read articles from other places, I'm just, this is what I've got in front of me right now. Next article is from November 9th, and that's actually from Melanie. I think that means Melanie Johnson. Uh, quote, libertarian elected in Manchester. Voting is palliative. Libertarian Colin Gibson was elected to Ward 4 moderator on November 7th. Colin won 738 to 331. There were eight write-in votes. Colin is an advocate of cryptocurrency, police accountability, and agorism. Colin is known by many in the liberty community and presumably by some in the anti-liberty community. However, there is no indication that he is known by the population at large. And he states that he did not run a campaign. Colin Run ran against Ibal 
Rejwan Day? I hope I'm saying that correct. She was not an incumbent as Woolard Lett, also, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Woolard Lett was the outgoing moderator, according to a phone call, to the Manchester City Clerk on November 9th at 1 p.m. I do not consider this an achievement of republicanism, more commonly, but less accurately known as democracy. I hold no delusions that the majority of people living under Manchester intended to elect, to elect a libertarian. But statism, statism is no more an efficient means of management than it is a moral one. And attempting or pretending, as the case may be, to spread power across the general population is an even more ridiculous form of organization. Running an organization is a work. Whether it's moral work or aggressive work is not relevant to the amount of time it takes. Expecting people to run the government, in addition to their actual jobs, and whatever else they may have going on in their lives, is unreasonable. Most people do not have the time to dedicate to hiring qualified people, whatever that means to them, and many do not have the inclination. If this method of hiring was suggested with any other organization, it would rightfully be laughed off. What makes you, I, or the other guy down the street any more qualified to choose the CEO of the U.S. than they are to choose the CEO of Shell? Nothing that I'm aware of. There are instances where one or more candidates declares their intention to kill, steal, or generally be predacious, more so than the other candidate. At the same time, I've seen some applications and resumes seriously submitted that had some very silly things on them. But this is not the norm. In most cases, people are left attempting to choose from equally horrible or equally cryptic candidates. Or they are asked to Sophie's choice, not only their rights, but the rights of the entire population. Which would you prefer, to lose gun rights for the chemo patients, or to be prevented from accessing marijuana? Uh, I'm not sure I read that right. To lose, to lose gun rights for chemo patients to be prevented from accessing marijuana? Uh, it doesn't sound right, no matter how I read it. Anyway, we're uh, continuing the quote of Melanie. Quote, is not an academic question for most people who are eligible to vote in the U.S. gang's elections. It dilutes feelings of responsibility. Of course, people are actually responsible for the actions that they take, and this includes ordering that a particular individual being given power. But people do act differently when they point out that they are not the only person who chooses a particular action. This gives reason to believe that large groups of people making a decision will make poorer decisions than smaller groups or single person will. People often vote for things that they would never enforce themselves, regardless of whether they had the means to do so. A temporary manager of a gang has more perverse incentives than a private property owner, or even than long-term manager of a gang. A person who is given run of landmass for eight years or so has an incentive to milk it for all it's worth and let his successor deal with the ruins. Even the state itself recognizes this when it puts fiduciary responsibilities on the right of use holders. It creates poor time preferences. Even a well-meaning official is judged on odd criteria. Instead of the long-term good of the area, Elections shift the focus onto hyper-short time frames, incentivizing officials to focus on short-term rather than long-term solutions, and encouraging voters to look for the same. Democracy and republicanism are worse than mob rule. In democracy, 50% plus one may enforce their will on the minority. Under republicanism, there may be further restrictions. In mob rule, 50% plus one may look around, decide they don't like those odds, and go off to mind their own business. Both systems allow people to undertake immoral acts that they would not otherwise undertake. This contributes to, but does not outright cause, as people are responsible for their own actions, the moral degradation of societies. Republicanism creates an even greater need for the occupying gang to convert members to its teaching. The DOE and public schools have the task of making sure that enough people subscribe to whatever it is that particular gang wants to get done. The gang no longer needs to 
uh, needs compliance, it needs your faith. It, it no longer needs just compliance, it needs your faith. If the gang does not successfully destroy independent thinking and enough eligible voters, those voters may decide to do something other than what the gang wants. And that is not the point of any form of government. To some extent, it is an illusion anyway. Ugh, this is Dave interjecting here. I'm getting tired of talking. If you want to read the rest of the article, it's on freekeen.com. Rare coins, pawns, gold, and silver bullion. Check out Port City Coin in Portsmouth, New Hampshire for your precious metal needs. A-plus rated with the Better Business Bureau. Happy to do a cash transaction. Why buy your medals from one of those slave state mints when you can support the free state economy? Visit PortCityCoin.com, or as I like to call it, PortCityCoin.com.